So Colossians chapter 1, that'll be on page 1041. We'll start at verse 15 and go through to verse 20. 23, in fact. (laughs) He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross." Once you are alienated and hostile in your minds, expressed in your evil actions. But now he has reconciled you by his physical body through his death to present you holy, faultless and blameless before him. If indeed you remain grounded and steadfast in the faith and are not shifted away from the hope of the gospel that you heard. This gospel has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven and I, Paul, have become a servant of it. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray as we come to nut out what this passage has to say. Heavenly Father, please give us ears to hear what your word has to tell us and the strength to put into practice what you would have us do. Amen. So if you remember nothing from this sermon, it was summed up pretty well by that last kid's song. Uh, So just keep singing that and you'll have the nuts and bolts of this passage down. Jesus is number one because of who he is and what he's done. It's exactly what Paul is getting at here. But just stop and think, when someone mentions Jesus, what do you think about? Or if you're like most people, you think about Christmas, then you think about Easter, and you probably stop there. Or maybe if you went to Sunday school lots, you'll think about some of the miracles. But we don't tend to think much more than that. But that's what this series has been about, finding the real Jesus. Seeing that Jesus really did live, really did die, really did rise again, so that he could be the king who served his people by bringing them into his kingdom. But Paul wants us to see that Jesus is much, much bigger than that. When we say that Jesus is number one, we don't just mean that he's bigger than the Queen or the President of the United States. We mean something quite a bit more than that. So at the start of this letter to the Colossians, Paul wants us to know exactly who Jesus is. He's just finished telling the Colossians that he's praying for them and praying that God would fill them with wisdom and knowledge of the will of God. And then he starts in verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God. Who's he? Well, he goes all the way back to verse 12, 13. He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. He's talking about the Son, God the Son, who came to earth as Jesus, the man. And so when he says he is the image of the invisible God, he's talking about Jesus. Jesus is the image of God. More often than not, if someone asks us the question, have you ever seen God? Our answer is, well, no, I haven't seen God. But that's not entirely true, because the answer should actually be, I could have. If you were living in first century Israel, walking around, you could have seen God. You could have seen God walking, talking, eating, sleeping. He was there. 
If you take, took a photo of God, you'd get a photo of Jesus. He is the full image of God. He came to show us exactly who God is. God the Son stepped off his throne and became human so that we could see who he is, what his character is like, what he likes, what he dislikes. So when we say Jesus is number one, we don't mean he's the king or the president. We mean he is God himself. And if that wasn't quite clear enough, Paul tells you everything was created by him. And when we say that everything was created by the sun, it's not that God just created the southern tip of Tasmania and the northern tip of Africa. He didn't just create a little bit. He created everything. Things that are visible, things that are invisible, rulers, authorities, thrones, dominions, all things have been created by him. So if you weren't quite sure what Paul was talking about, he makes it very clear. The God who created the world came to us as Jesus the man to show us who he is. In this first half of this song that Paul is writing for us, he wants us to know Jesus is supreme. He is the ultimate God. He is the top of the pedestal. You cannot get higher in authority than him. But did you notice something odd in verse 16? All things have been created through him and for him. Jesus is not just the one who created the world. He's the reason why it was created. God the Father created through the Son and the Spirit, and he did so all for the Son who came to us in Jesus. He's the one who gives us purpose and meaning, and not just us as God's people, but the whole world, the whole universe of creation finds its meaning in him. Gives a very different perspective to Jesus is number one, doesn't it? Do you treat Jesus as the creator and as God? Or are you treating him like a life coach who you can ignore when you don't like what he says? Because if Jesus really is number one, if he really is God himself, we need to take him very seriously. But we also see that this God is not distant or far off. In Jesus, God the Son comes and lives amongst us, shares our pain and our suffering. But even more than that, have a look at verse 17. In him, all things hold together. Jesus is the one who's keeping the world ticking. He's the one who makes sure it keeps spinning and that everything keeps running well. I can't even keep a house plant alive for more than a month. And yet somehow I think that I know better than the God who keeps the world turning. How arrogant. No, when we come to find God, we find not only the one who thing was created for, everything was created by him, but he's the one who keeps it turning. And we need to make sure we give him the reverence that that deserves. Give him the honour and respect that that deserves. So having showed us the supremacy of Jesus in the creation, Paul now moves on because he wants us to sh- he wants to show us the sufficiency of what he has done for us. He moves on, he says that Jesus is the head of the church. Without Jesus there is no church. Any church that tries to remove Jesus from the head is no longer a church. This is why we've spent so long talking about just Jesus. He is the head. If Jesus wasn't around, we would not be a church. He has brought us all here because of what he has done for us. And if Bernard 
myself or anybody else tries to preach a message other than Jesus, that's a message that leads to death that should be ignored. Jesus is the head of the church. But Jesus does more than that with his life. He doesn't just start a social club. Have a look at verse 20. The Father sent the Son to reconcile all things to himself. So when we say all things, the Bible in other places teaches very clearly that not everyone will be saved. All things here is explained later on. He says things in heaven, things on earth. He's talking about all of creation. Our sin has broken not just ourselves and our relationship with God, it has broken the creation. And Jesus' death allows all things to be reconciled to God, to be put in their proper place under him. Now, reconciliation is always a two-way street. Both parties need to be happy to reconcile for it to work. And so there will be people in our lives who reject that reconciliation. But whether they like it or not, eventually all things will be put in their proper place. Those who love God will join with him in eternal life in the new creation. And those who reject God's offer of reconciliation will be raised to judgment. So all things means that the whole of creation will be made new will be freed from the curse of sin when the Son comes again to claim his inheritance. And so we need to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to find reconciliation with God. Paul expands on this in 21 to 23. We were once alienated, hostile in our minds, but now he has reconciled us. We can now come before God as holy and blameless, not because of anything that we have done, but because of everything that Jesus has done for us. This is why Paul, in verse 19, says quite plainly, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. Because if Jesus wasn't God, there would be no reconciliation. When a crime has been committed, there are only two people who can make reconciliation, the victim and the offender. Only the offender can take the punishment for the crime. Anything else would be unjust. And only the victim can offer forgiveness. Because God the Son came as the man Jesus, he can be both. As a man, he stands in our place and says, I will take the punishment our sins deserve. And because he is fully God, he can stand in the place of the victim and say, I forgive you. I have taken the punishment on myself. And this is why Paul wants to show us that Jesus is fully sufficient for bringing us to God and reconciling us to the one who created us. He's the only one qualified to do it. He's the only one who can stand in our place and take our punishment. He's the only one who can stand also in the place of the victim of our sin and offer forgiveness. So what does Paul want us to do with all this? Well, he tells us, In verse 23, if indeed you remain grounded and steadfast in the faith and are not shifted away from the gospel that you've heard. Paul wants us to remain grounded. He wants us to be certain of the things that we have been taught. All the fantastical elements of the gospel where we are told that we can be right with God where we are told that we will rise to new life and live with him, are all possible because of who Jesus is and what he has done for us. 
He can offer us forgiveness because he really is God who came to live with us. He can give us new life because, as we heard two weeks ago, he raised in a real resurrection that offers us the chance to join him in the new creation. Jesus is the only one fully sufficient to bring us to God because he is fully supreme and has the authority to do so. Jesus is number one. Who he is, God himself, come to show us who God is and what he's done in dying and rising again, that's what makes him number one and what gives him all authority to bring us back to God so that we can be certain of the things that we have been taught and we can be fully assured that when he comes again, we will be welcomed into the new creation as his people. This is why we need to stop trying to add to what Jesus has done for us. Because every time we try to add our good works to what Jesus has done, we take away from what he has done. He has done everything required. He's the only one qualified to bring us to God. And because he is the king who serves his people, he does so and brings us before God as holy and blameless so that we can live for him. Our job now is to show others that we are living for him. We can't treat him like a life coach and ignore the bits of what he says that we don't like. We listen and obey not because listening and obeying is what saves us, but because it shows that we have been saved. If you worked at Mitre 10 and someone wanted to know whether you did or not, how would they know? Well, you put the uniform on when you go to work. That way all the customers know they can ask you where to find things. Listening and obeying to Jesus' commands are our uniform. That is how the people know that we are one of God's people. That is how they know they can ask us about God and how to become members of his family. And as we do so, we know we can be sure of everything that God has told us because he himself has told us. We started this series by asking the question, who is the real Jesus? And over these last few weeks, we've seen that in his life, death and resurrection, we see God, God himself, come to share our lives, our pain and our suffering and bring us to himself, no longer as his enemies, but as his sons and daughters. He's the king who died the death of a servant so that we could join him in the new creation. And he experienced a real resurrection that guarantees our own. What do you think of when you think of Jesus? Do you just stop at Christmas and Easter? Well, I hope this passage from Colossians has expanded your mind about who Jesus is. God himself, the one who created the world and the one for whom it was created, and also the one who died for us so that we could live for him forever in the new creation. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for your son. We thank you that in your son you show us who you really are and that you open the way for us to be reconciled with you. And we pray now that you would help us to grow in our understanding of your son so that we might live for him and share that knowledge with anyone who asks. Amen.